was there this morning for this idea to look at the past and keep it alive for future generations. With about a thousand people below at the same park that bears the name of William Gaines Jr. of Port Charlotte, three different flyovers to honor Corporal Gaines from above and all the veterans who served in Beirut. Michael Gaines has been a driving force ever since that day, October 23rd, 1983, when his family learned his older brother had died. I was 14, I was a freshman in high school, and I thought, like you said, I mean, the world's just gonna keep on going, right? But it stopped me in my tracks. Bill Gaines had just turned 21 and was recently married, ready to start his life, but it ended along with the lives of 240 other American military service members, most of the Marines, but also sailors and soldiers. With the ceremonial shovels, now the Beirut Peacekeepers Memorial Tower is set to go up. Three stories to educate people on the three years the U.S. military served on the ground during Lebanon's Civil War. In Charlotte County and, and has made a big step in helping us to remember. And it's not just for the Beirut Marines, you know, it's for all military, for all the campaigns that are not talked about. This ceremony brought brought out a large crowd, a blend of the somber with the hugs and the embraces of veterans who were there. A gathering point to remind us all that each veteran has their own story, their own journey. And for what I want people to know about him and the reason that I remember him so much is he was a really good brother. He took care of me. He was seven years older than me. But, you know, he he was a good role model for me and I wanted to, to be like him and I feel like he was gone and I've carried that, that memory. And I also know that because he was my big brother, if he was still alive, he'd be kicking my butt to do these things now. I love that, hearing mm -hmm. about them. Project leaders say they still have about $1.5 million to raise to pay for that tower. Yeah, the William R. Gaines Jr. Veterans Memorial Park already has a gold star memorial, as well as separate memorials to honor the service of the veterans and first responders. And we know so many people love to visit our veterans memorials here across Southwest Florida. We're so happy that's opened. Well, let's go ahead and get a live look now over the Bayfront Inn in Naples. And Shari, this afternoon looking a lot different than this morning. It was way more gloomy, but those showers have cleared out. That's right. As we bring in Fox 4 certified meteor meteorologist Katie Walls, where Katie, those temperatures behind you look very different than they did this morning. Exactly. So overall, it was a chilly start. We all started off in the 50s, but highs today only climbing into the 70s. So not only was it the coolest morning since mid-February, it's also the coolest afternoon since mid-February. Overall, our temperatures today running anywhere from 8 to 10 degrees cooler compared to this time yesterday. Right now, Fort Myers reporting 8 degrees cooler. Punta Gorda right now running about 10 degrees cooler. So here is our weather setup. We had this little wave of energy move through. Some of you might have felt some of those light rain showers push through your area, but already the showers have cleared out and those clouds are clearing out from the north to the south as well. Just a couple of lingering clouds here for parts of 10,000 Islands in eastern Collier County. But here in Lee County, the clouds are done. High pressure is building in as we look live from the Luminary Hotel in downtown Fort Myers. Dew point the measure of moisture in the air, that is exceptionally low. Clear sky, lighter wind, that will be conducive for our temperatures to drop more so tonight. Even cooler temperatures expected to kick off tomorrow. So if you thought this morning was cold, get ready because tomorrow will be running several degrees cooler as that wind lightens up a little bit overnight and that will allow those temperatures to drop closer to those dew points. Look how dry it is outside right now. Your skin might be feeling it right now. Dew point, the measure of moisture in the air sitting at 46 degrees in Golden Gate and Naples and just 47 degrees right now in Fort Myers. So overnight tonight, here's where we're headed. This is how we'll wake up for your Thursday morning. Around 55 degrees for Immokalee and LaBelle, 54 for Fort Myers, 51 degrees for Arcadia. It's going to be one of those days you might want to layer up. Extra layer for the morning, but by the afternoon, we are heading back to the 80s. So we will see quite the temperature swing for tomorrow. So tomorrow, a chilly start by Friday morning. We're back to normal. And then Saturday, we'll see a bit of a warm surge ahead of yet another cold front, a cold front that will be passing through over the weekend. That will not only bring us some cooler temperatures for the start of next week, it will also be elevating our rain chances over the weekend. But for now, we're done with the wet weather for the next couple of days. Let's take a closer look overnight tonight. Clear skies forecast, lighter winds, and tomorrow those winds are expected to be offshore. That's a good thing. That means most of our beaches will not have to deal with red tide concentrations. 
that are airborne, so excellent news. Otherwise, lots of sunshine on tap for your Thursday. A few clouds expected for the afternoon, but that's about it. Otherwise, looking ahead to your Friday. Friday, of course, being St. Patrick's Day, we can expect partly cloudy skies as we continue through the day. And then with warm southerly winds pumping up those temperatures, it will be an even hotter Friday afternoon. But as of right now, your Friday evening looking great for festivities before rain chances increase for Saturday. But overnight tonight, we're dropping into the 50s, so get ready for that tomorrow morning. Could come as a shock to some of you, but those highs tomorrow afternoon, warmer than today. So instead of hitting highs in the 70s, we're back to the 80s tomorrow afternoon, forecasting a high around 84 degrees. Not just for your Thursday, but into your St. Patrick's Day as well. Then over the weekend, showers and storms expected starting Saturday afternoon and evening, continuing on and off Sunday into the start of next week. Today, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin says the U.S. will continue to do surveillance flights in international airspace following a Russian warplane striking down an American drone. The incident over the Black Sea yesterday is the first known physical contact between Russian and U.S. militaries since the war in Ukraine started. Austin says this was an unsafe and risky action by Russia. Russian authorities say they'll try to recover debris from the drone. Landmines have been playing a big part in Russia's attack on Ukraine, and how they're used is also impacting us here in the U.S. The explosives can be placed on farms, near schools, and even in the backyards of civilians. It's a part of the war that's been ongoing since 2014, long before one was officially declared. This is one of them. It's shaped a bit like a butterfly. They're distributed by rockets, by their thousands, and so many of them actually don't explode on impact. They become devices that are there for years unless somebody clears them. And just by virtue of how they look, they are, they are something that are a threat to kids. And in general, the victims of them are quite often children. He's with Halo Trust, the world's largest mine clearance organization. They've been working to train Ukrainians on how to safely clear landmines. In addition to this being a gruesome war tactic that can hurt children, when landmines go off on farms, it can also hurt the global food supply. Ukraine has been the breadbasket of, of the earth. And I'd say that the majority of land mi or minefields that I've been in, in Ukraine, uh, the, the common factor is a, a farmer got back into his tractor looking to plow his field as soon as the Russians had vacated and blew up on an anti-tank mine. This war is driving, uh, are driving prices for us in the United States, and they're driving prices for those who can barely afford food anyway. Halo Trust uses donations to invest in new technologies that can help clear landmines. Multiple sclerosis has long been thought of as a young white woman's disease, but that's not the case. The new attention on the disease among black Americans and getting treatment sooner.
The National Audubon Society says today it will keep its name amid pressure to change it. The organization works to protect birds and their habitats. Their name has been in the spotlight recently because of the man they're named after has a dark history with enslavement. But after a year of meetings and feedback from surveys on the topic, the board of directors ultimately were worried that if they changed their name, they would no longer be recognized as the leading group for bird conservation. Well, after a record 31 years, labs are no longer America's favorite dog breed. The French Bulldog has been voted into the top spot, according to the American Kennel Club. One French Bulldog organization believes it's because they're friendly and pretty low maintenance when it comes to grooming and exercise. But there is a lot of debate over the ethics of French Bulldog breeding. They're prone to breathing, spinal, eye and skin conditions. Well, a growing number of cities are hoping street art will help revitalize neighborhoods. Tomorrow, we're looking into the big economic impact local businesses are seeing from this artistic expression. But still to come today, addressing teacher shortages in a new way. What one school is doing with refugees that they say can be replicated across the country. And still to come here on Fox 4 News at 5. It's not your typical police training, but we've got a first-hand look at how police from across our state trained alongside their canine partners. And as for our temperatures today, still waiting for the official almanac to come in, but we started off below normal, highs below average as well. We'll talk more about how long this cool snap lasts next.
Well, an FBI raid in a Naples neighborhood. Why federal agents are looking for the suspect at the center of a nationwide manhunt. Live from Southwest Florida, you're watching Fox 4 News at 5. And thank you for trusting us here at Fox 4 News at 5. I'm Shari Armstrong. And I'm Nadine Yanis. Federal agents swarm a Collier County home as part of a nationwide manhunt today. That's right. The case centers around a former Maryland state official who skipped out on his fraud and embezzlement trial. Fox 4's Ryan Kruger joins us live from a preserve in Naples. And Ryan, you spoke with a witness who recorded video of this raid. And he tells me as soon as he saw a row of vehicles filled with federal agents lining up here at the gates of his community, he knew exactly who they were looking for. So let's go ahead and show you that video that we were talking about. It's taken by a man named Robert Desiano. He runs the hyperlocal news website called Naples News Now, but he also happens to live in this neighborhood. And on Monday, he found out one of his new neighbors is a fugitive from the law. That man's name is Roy McGrath. He is the former chief of staff for former Maryland government. Larry Hogan. Now, on Monday, McGrath was supposed to begin a federal trial for fraud and embezzlement charges, but he never showed up to the courthouse in D.C. County records show that he bought the home here in Naples in October of 2021. McGrath's lawyer confirmed with our Fox affiliate in Baltimore that the FBI conducted a search warrant at McGrath's house here in Naples, but McGrath wasn't there. Most importantly, I'm concerned about Roy. Uh, I hope that he's safe. I know that these situations are very stressful. The uncertainty of going to trial can cause people to do things that we may not believe are appropriate. But uh, most importantly, I hope that he's safe. And McGrath's lawyer says that even his own wife doesn't know where McGrath is located at this time. She is cooperating with authorities, according to the lawyer. She is also, though, expressing concern for her husband's well-being. Now, back out here live, coming up at 6 o'clock, you're going to hear from that neighbor who recorded the video. I asked him, what does he think about the fact that his gated community in Naples, now the center of a nationwide manhunt? His reaction coming up in about 30 minutes. But for now, we are live in Naples. Ryan Kruger. Fox 4. Ryan, thank you so much from Collier County to Lee County tonight, where Fort Myers Police Department held a canine training. Officers not only from the state of Florida, but from out of state as well, attended this training. Take a look. Show us your hands. Go, 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 so today focused on high intensity training. Attendees went over all different types of scenarios. The trainers make the situation as real as possible to prepare these canines and their handlers for when they are out on calls. You know that when you need that dog to deploy, he's going to be successful. He's going to keep the community safe by doing his job and he's going to keep the officer safe by doing his job. Coming up on Fox 4 News at 6, our Elise Chingari, as you see here, was at that training today. You're going to hear from the instructors who law enforcement say are some of the best trainers in the country and why so many different departments participated today. Well, in Sarasota County, an early morning fire left two buildings damaged. That fire started at the Bay Indies Clubhouse in Venice this morning. Firefighters say embers actually landed on the roof of a home nearby and then started another fire. No one was injured, but this does talk about the dry conditions that we've been seeing. The cause of the fire at the clubhouse, though, still under investigation tonight. Also, there was a massive donation today for a project that could revitalize the Dunbar neighborhood. Today, the North Law Firm, Joe North and his partners, donating $100,000 to the Lee County Black History Society. We love to see it. They are now the first community partner to donate for a planned black cultural center right there in Clemente Park. The Lee County Black History Society is working with the city of Fort Myers as well to plan for the 22 million three story building. You see it right here. The vision is for the center to host concerts, art exhibits, and even recording studios right there in the heart of Dunbar. People are cutting back on spending. The news feed starts with those government numbers out today. People trimmed their spending by 0.4% in February after a big increase in January. Sales in February slipped at department stores, restaurants, and furniture stores. Well, eggs are finally getting cheaper at the grocery store. In February, the price of eggs fell 6.7% compared to January. That's according to new numbers from the Department of Labor Statistics. But grocery prices overall got more expensive 
during that time, rising 0.3%. Tyson is laying off close to 1,700 workers as it closes two poultry plants. The company says it's doing this to try to boost profits. The plants in Virginia and Arkansas will shut down in May. Well, we've seen schools get creative to help solve the teacher shortage crisis, but the efforts you're about to see is solving multiple problems at once. Alexa Liako found that it's not only getting teachers into classrooms, but it's helping refugees in America restart their lives. Yeah, it's very beautiful. You like this color, Leila? Being in a classroom reminds Sadia Alani of home. So I am from Iraq. There, Alani studied to be a teacher. After I graduated in my country and I have a lot of dreams. But political unrest forced Alani, her husband, a translator for the U.S. Army, and their three kids to flee. I have a lot of memories. Uh, we left everything, like our family, our <laughs> everything. They waited to come to the U.S. for six years as refugees in Lebanon. When they finally made it to the States, Alani's teaching dreams were delayed again. I start working like as bakery until I like develop my language and then I ask if I can uh, work with my degrees and the people will say oh that's impossible because your degrees are from not here. But she found a place that recognized her hard work and education. I like to be a construction worker when I grow up. Do you want to be like a mechanical? The International Community School just outside of Atlanta is a school for both American and international children. Here refugee students are welcomed and so are their parents. The Refugee Women's Network partnered with the school to train refugee women to get their teaching credentials. This was such a godsend. Sushma Barakoti is the executive director of the nonprofit. She says refugee women want to help their families but are often not given a chance. So most of the time, women always have the back seat because um, it's so important for somebody in the family to get a job, and that's men in the family most of the time. But with help from the school's leader, Fran Carroll, these women's education is being put to use, helping both the women and the school. How are we going to solve this teacher shortage that we're in facing, as well as bring some diversity into our school? This is another demographic that can solve and help solution that problem. While these refugee women take classes to earn their teaching certification, they help teach and interact with students and families, both American and international. Representation matters, so it's important that our students see um, figures in the classroom that they can relate to, who speaks their language, who shares their same customs. Our American children are able to learn about different cultures and customs, and that information is shared in an organic manner. And as the national teacher shortage only worsens, the team here hopes to be an example of how to educate and build community all at once. We can approach education differently, and so it's going to take innovation to really just flip this whole industry upside down and this is something that can definitely be replicated and a program that if replicated means so much more than a job so I have a future I have a goal and I'm walking in my with, to my goal Alexa Liako Scripps News Atlanta Alexa thank you for that report survivors of mass shootings are finding healing through music it gives us a place to just open up and let everything out that we've ever felt. How LGBTQ choirs are offering this outlet.
There's a big new recall today from Honda over seat belts that may not work. Half a million cars in the U.S. and Canada are impacted. The coating on the front seat belt buckle can deteriorate over time, and the buckle may not latch. This impacts the CRV, Accord, Odyssey, Insight, and Acura RDX models you see on your screen. You'll get a letter next month about fixing this. Price cuts are coming soon for people on Medicare. Today, U.S. health leaders released the first list of drugs that had prices go up higher than inflation, meaning you'll get a rebate on them. Those rebates companies have to pay are happening because of a new federal law. If they don't pay, they could face a penalty that's 125 percent of the rebate amount. The 27 drugs named today include arthritis drug Humira, a lymphoma therapy from Gilead Sciences, and Segan Inc.'s targeted cancer therapy. The savings on the drugs is expected to be between $2 and $390 a dose. This goes into effect April 1st. Well, blueberries and green beans have joined the Environmental Working Group's Dirty Dozen list this year. That's a list of the top 12 non-organic types of produce with the most pesticides on them. Strawberries and spinach continue to hold the top two spots. The EWG says this should act as a reminder to wash all your produce before you eat it. Well, a new pilot program is looking at if training service dogs could be a form of therapy for veterans with PTSD. Elizabeth Ruiz shows us the results they're seeing so far. Say that you're a veteran who's been diagnosed with PTSD. Lap. Yes. These dogs have been trained to help you stay grounded. Unconditional love. <laughs> She's like, I could touch it, I promise. It's the way Andres Ortiz Rodriguez explains his bond with Linda. He's training Linda to be a service dog for another fellow veteran. My stepdad was in the Army. He was a tanker at Fort Knox. So I kind of just wanted to follow in his footsteps. My brother joined uh, the Air Force. He deployed to Kuwait. Andres was deployed to Iraq in 2011. A couple years ago, he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. He says the mental health doctor is the one who told him about Paws for Purple Hearts. Linda, off. Paws for Purple Hearts is a nonprofit. Yes. We provide a really unique program called Canine Assisted Warrior Therapy, where we partner with VA and DOD facilities locally in the area, and groups of veterans or active duty service members actually help partake in the training of our service dogs for another fellow service member. Whoa. Senior program instructor Erica Horn says she was thrilled when asked to participate in a five-year pilot program through the PAWS Act. PAWS stands for Puppies Assisting Wounded Service Members. The U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs says its goal is to explore the benefits of service dog training for veterans with PTSD. The pilot program is being offered in Alaska, California, Florida, North Carolina, and Texas. Good girl. Get it! The dog can help just by its presence, but also they can be specifically task trained to help bring an individual, maybe ground them in the moment if they're having a panic attack or, you know, they get startled by a loud noise or something like that. The dog can provide deep pressure therapy by, you know, leaning against them or nudging them to bring them back to reality. Go to bed. They're only six months into the pilot program, but Erica says she's already seen a huge difference in the lives of veterans. Can I Week by week, I will see individuals open up a lot more and just really make that connection with the dog. When we sat down to talk with Andres, we saw the impact Linda had on him. You're, you learn to kind of just suppress your feelings, just show anger, just because realistically, you don't have time to show emotion over there. Um, if something hits the fan, you're, you kind of just have to react. It, it just kind of like... <sighs> Like I said, it's just hard for me to show feelings. So like, you know, just being able to see her here and like just, so it's a different, you know. I know, baby, I know. A psychologist with the South Texas VA says this pilot program has been giving service members like Andres a greater purpose in life and getting them out into the community. If the pilot program proves to be successful through data over the next five years, the VA says it will be offered as another therapy option for veterans across the country. Elizabeth Ruiz, Scripps News, San Antonio.
All right, so you might have heard of a blob, twice the <laughs> width of the continental United States, that's heading towards Florida's coast. But despite the headlines, experts at Florida Gulf Coast University are saying, not so fast. Yes, it is a blob, a 5,000 mile long blob of seaweed called the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt naturally occurs every year. And if the right combination of currents and wind are actually in place, over 10 million tons of this seaweed can actually wash up on the beaches right along the Gulf of Mexico and the Mid-Atlantic. But listen to this, FGC Water School Dr. Barry Rosen says that this bloom appears to be decreasing. Meteorologist Andrew Slipley has everything you need to know about this bloom and why it actually might be good for us. We'll explain at Fox 4 News at 6. And welcome back to the Fox 4 Weather Center. Just in our official climatology report for the day. And friends, we're talking about the coolest day so far this month and the coolest day going back to mid-February. So we officially started off at 57 degrees this morning. High temperatures only rose into the mid-70s. Five degrees cooler than average. The only day so far, the month of March, that we've actually been below normal. But while tomorrow it's going to be a chilly start by tomorrow afternoon, we are right back into the mid 80s. We always talk about our cool snaps being just that brief snaps. And again, by tomorrow afternoon, we're pushing toward the mid 80s. Same story heading into your Friday, the normal being 81 degrees. That will be the case on Saturday, Saturday. Unfortunately, that's going to be our next opportunity for wet weather as a cold front approaches and behind that front will feel its effects Sunday into Monday. Much, much cooler air expected. Highs only running in the low to mid 70s as we kick off next week. So with that next cold front, that's our next opportunity for wet weather. And again, unfortunately, timing out 
to potentially dampen some outdoor weekend plans. So if you do have outdoor plans made, just a heads up, have a contingency plan just in case. It does look like the highest probability of that wet weather on Saturday will be arriving the second half of the day. Of course, we'll continue to fine tune that here at Fox 4 as new data arrive. But as of right now, those probabilities are elevated and they will stay elevated into the start of next week as well. As you know, we could really use that rainfall. Moderate to severe drought conditions continue here across southwest Florida. Even despite a couple of rounds of rainfall that we've seen here, Punta Gorda, we've picked up just over an inch in the rain gauge since March 1st. Naples, we've picked up almost a quarter inch. And Fort Myers, all of two hundredths for the entire month so far. So all of us still certainly in deficit. That means those burn bans will remain in place until we see a healthy soaking rain. As for those temperatures now, definitely starting to cool down here in Arcadia, already down to 68 degrees, 69 right now for Northport, currently sitting at 75 degrees in Fort Myers, 73 currently in Bonita Springs, all around running cooler compared to this time yesterday by eight to 10 degrees. So definitely a much chillier afternoon. So the first half of today, we dealt with the clouds. We dealt with some spotty rain showers pushing through. Those showers continue to work their way southward. In its wake, high pressure is building in. So we are now starting to see those clouds clear out, and we can expect sunshine for the rest of today, at least another hour or so. And then by tonight, heading into tomorrow, lots of sunshine forecast as well. And there you go. You can really see not a cloud in sight, dramatically different compared to this morning. Right now outside, we're sitting at 75 degrees dew point, the measure of moisture in the air. That is in the 40s. And with the clear sky, lighter wind, our temperatures will try to drop close to that dew point. So they're going to try to drop toward the 40s. However, thankfully, we'll have just enough of a breeze. Not worried about 40s, but some counties could be close. Arcadia, we're going to be dropping down toward 51 degrees. Fort Myers looking for a morning temperature around 54. Naples will be starting off the day around 56, so even chillier compared to today. But as for tomorrow afternoon, we're back to the middle 80s. So tomorrow, definitely a day you'll want to layer. You'll likely want the extra layer in the morning, but you'll be shedding it for the afternoon. St. Patrick's Day looking great to get outside and enjoy. 84 degrees for a high with a partly cloudy sky before storms arrive over the weekend. In just the first 64 days of the year, we surpassed 100 mass shootings in the U.S. That's according to tracking by the Gun Violence Archive. Music is part of what's helping some communities heal after a mass shooting. Jesse Cohen shows us the role LGBTQ plus choirs are playing. Singing in a room like this is more than creating a tune. Breathing in the reality of the world around them and exhaling the emotions that come with it. Seasons come round again. It gives me a chance to show some emotions that I might not otherwise show. As a member of the LGBTQ plus choir Harmony, Lisa Cisneros says those emotional musical opportunities are crucial to her well-being and they have been for most of her adult life. In a lot of ways, Harmony made it possible for me to just say, I don't care what anybody thinks. And eventually through singing with Harmony, um, I got to a place where I could come out to my family not worrying about whether I would lose my family. LGBTQ plus choirs were originally created out of tragedy, dating back to the AIDS crisis. For years, they have continued to serve as a place of safety and healing for this community. I'm a graduate of Columbine High. My mother calls me every time there's a mass shooting to see if I'm okay. <laughs> When mass shootings like Orlando's Pulse nightclub or Colorado Springs Club Q happen, we hear about these communities mourning. But it's groups like Harmony, these members say, that help the healing continue when the media spotlight wears off. When Pulse happened, it was a shock to all of us. It doesn't go away. It affects you forever. A record-breaking number of murders against trans people occurred in 2020, according to the Human Rights Campaign. 44% of lesbian women have experienced rape, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner, and 70% of LGBTQ plus members have been sexually harassed at work. And when you're in the midst of it, and you're trapped in a place like that, you need a place to go where there is no judgment. There's no, well, if you hadn't been out at the gay bar. Grief has no guaranteed route, and neither does trauma. 
Music is the thread that helps these singers navigate their personal journeys. It gives us a place to just open up and let everything out that we've ever felt. We have these traumas from so many other places and only this family really gets the totality of that. Whether it's pain you are experiencing now, neglect from 20 years ago, or ongoing grief, groups like Harmony are dedicated to serving as a safe space for healing. <laughs> Jesse Cohen, Scripps News, Denver. Jesse, thank you for that report. Well, that's going to do it for us today. I'm Michelle London. Fox 4 News at 6 is next. The woman who is the sponsor of Florida's six-week abortion bill is from right here in Southwest Florida, and she wants to create a, quote, society where abortion is unthinkable. We can help change the national debate. Fox 4's Capitol Reporter sitting down with her for the first time. A raid on a home in Naples connected to serious crimes in Maryland. What federal investigators say they were searching for today. And three high-rise condo buildings are on the way to Fort Myers, but something is in the way. We'll tell you what has to get done before downtown skyline changes. Live from Southwest Florida, you're watching Fox 4 News at 6. Tonight, state Republican legislators are moving forward with a six-week abortion ban. Thanks for joining us here on Fox 4 News at 6. I'm Shari Armstrong. And I'm Nadine Yanis. And the lawmaker leading that charge is a representative from right here in Southwest. West Florida. The bill's sponsor, Jenna Persons Malika, is representing District 78. That includes all of Fort Myers down through Bonita Springs. And Fox 4's Capitol reporter, Forrest Saunders, was the first person to sit down with her in a one on one interview. He's joining us live tonight. And Forrest, this is a bill that's got a lot of people talking, and you actually had a chance to learn more about it today. Yeah, absolutely. And from the sponsor her, herself, uh, if Jenna Persons Malika sounds familiar, that's because last year she was the one of the carriers of the 15-week abortion ban, which uh, lawmakers passed and the governor signed into law. She's now out front on this six-week ban, and she says it's one step towards her bigger goal, which is banning abortion outright coast to coast. We can help change the national debate and the national discussion. State Rep Jenna Persons Malika laying out her hopes for the future of abortion Wednesday. Ultimately, our goal is to create a society where abortion is unthinkable. 
The Fort Myers Republican, a believer in life at conception, thinking her controversial House Bill HB7 is a step forward. If signed by the governor and upheld by state courts, Florida abortions would be restricted after six instead of 15 weeks, with exceptions for rape, incest, and fatal fetal conditions. Due to science, we can see a heartbeat at six weeks, and a heartbeat is an irrefutable evidence of life. The lawmaker resolute in that belief, despite disagreement in the medical community. Experts cited in various reports prefer cardiac activity at six weeks, saying pulses are sporadic, the heart not fully formed. When abortion is under attack, what do we do? Meanwhile, Florida's abortion advocates warn six weeks is before many know they're pregnant, fearing thousands, especially lower income minority women, will be unable to access the procedure and turn to unsafe alternatives. It is effectively an outright ban. Democrats have vowed a war, saying they may lack the numbers needed, but will take the issue to the court of public opinion. This isn't good for them. This won't look good. You know what? We're going to call it like we see it. It's crap. Giving them steam the midterms, where voters in two red states rejected measures weakening abortion protections, while some national polling suggests cutting access isn't popular. Do you have any concern that maybe your beliefs may be in the minority here in the state of Florida and that most people don't want this? Persons Maleka, however, feeling emboldened by the elections. The voters in the state of Florida have sent to the legislature majorities in both chambers that are pro-life majorities. The lawmaker says she's committed to HB7, regardless of the growing criticism ahead of its first committee stop, another step she believes towards abortion's end. There is no greater purpose that drives me than giving every child an opportunity to be born and an opportunity to, to live and find their purpose in life. We wouldn't be having this national debate if none of us were born. Okay, so what's the next step here for HB7? Well, it's in its first committee tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. It's a House subcommittee on health care, and it's slated for a three-hour discussion. And you can bet, given how controversial this policy is, how many lawmakers will want to debate it, they're probably going to use all of that time. That's the latest out here at the Capitol. I'm Forrest Saunders reporting. All right, Forrest, thank you. Also today, we were keeping an eye out on some power outages. We know we were tracking some sprinkles and showers, at least at one point in Cape Coral, up to 30,000 people were out of power. It didn't last too long, though, only about 10 minutes. And as you can see, Shari, things have cleared up. We did notice it was a little cooler today, mm -hmm. though, especially this morning. So let's bring in Fox 4 certified meteorologist Katie Walls, who has a look at your current temperatures and what to expect. Hi, Katie. Good afternoon. So the morning temperature, the afternoon temperature, temperature overall we were the coldest obviously that we've been so far this month and the coolest going back to mid February it has been exactly one month since we've seen highs only in the mid 70s and even right now in downtown Fort Myers where it's 74 degrees dew point measure of moisture in the air that is exceptionally dry here's why it matters the lower the dew point goes with a clear sky and a light wind our temperatures will try to drop toward that dew point so that's why this morning was so chilly especially compared to where those lows have been. Take a look at this comparing the last five days or so. This morning's low in Fort Myers 57 61 for Naples. Meanwhile, looking back to say Monday morning, we started off in the low and mid 70s. Meanwhile, tomorrow morning, the mid 50s are on the way even chillier compared to this morning by a couple of degrees. So if you thought it was cold this morning, get ready. Tomorrow is even cooler. Coming up, we'll take a closer look at just how long this will last. And we're timing another cold front arriving this weekend. Katie, we'll be watching out. Thank you. Well, heavily armed federal agents raided a Collier County home today. You see it here. All of this a part of a nationwide manhunt for Roy McGrath. He is the former chief of staff for the ex-governor of Maryland, and he now lives in Naples. McGrath was supposed to begin his federal trial on fraud and embezzlement charges on Monday, but he never showed up. And after the raid at his home here in the Rafia Preserve neighborhood in Collier County, there is still no sign of him at this hour. Fox 4 Investigates' Ryan Kruger joins us live from near McGrath's neighborhood. And Ryan, you spoke with a witness who watched agents swarm that home. And he tells me he had never even heard of Roy McGrath up until two days ago. But as soon as he saw a row of cars full of federal agents approaching the gates of his neighborhood here in Collier County, he knew exactly who they were looking for. The quiet community of Rafia Preserve in Naples 
has found itself in the middle of a nationwide manhunt for a fugitive on the run. Federal agents swarmed the home of former Maryland public official Roy McGrath. His neighbor, Robert Desiano, recorded this video. Tell me what you saw. There was, uh, like I said, a bunch of cars, about eight or nine, and then they got out of the car, and there was uh, definitely automatic weapons drawn. They had the shield, too. Desiano runs the hyperlocal website Naples News Now. He also lives in this neighborhood. He tells me Wednesday morning he was on his way to the gym when he saw several armored vehicles full of federal agents coming through the gates and approaching McGrath's house. A woman came out, and I'm assuming that's his wife, I don't know, and then shortly thereafter they all went in. And I stood, I stood around for a while, uh, but I didn't see any uh, anything with him. I didn't see them taking him out. County records show McGrath bought the home in October of 2021. This comes as he's set to begin trial on charges that he falsified government documents and took a bogus severance payment of nearly a quarter of a million dollars. McGrath didn't show to his federal trial on Monday, and on Tuesday, the U.S. Marshals Service put out a wanted poster. By Wednesday, federal agents descended onto this Naples community. What do you think about the fact that you've got this nationwide manhunt centering on your quiet little gated community? Oh, you know, uh, good question. You'll have bad, good and bad people everywhere you live. So, of course, the question of the night is, where is Roy McGrath? His own lawyer says he hasn't spoken with him since Sunday night. He says that his own wife doesn't even know where he is tonight. She has expressed concern, though, for his well-being. We're live tonight in Naples. Ryan Kruger, Fox 4. Thank you so much. Covering Lee County tonight, two men that Cape Coral Police say were planning to sell fentanyl in the community have been arrested. The police department says this follows a long and intricate undercover operation. The suspects are 26-year-old Thomas Dean of Lehigh Acres and 20-year-old Sean Bonamy of Fort Myers. They're facing felony drug charges tonight. Undercover investigators say they discovered plans the two suspects made to sell fentanyl in Cape Coral. Now, both men are charged with intent to sell, but many is facing charges for the sale of fentanyl in the amount of more than three grams. The DEA says that's 3,000 times the lethal dose of 0.2 milligrams. Well, all lanes are back open on Briar Cliff Road in Lee County after this crash where deputies say two horses were hit by a car this morning. They tell us both of those horses unfortunately had to be put down. The car, as well as you can see here, had some serious damage. No word tonight on how the driver is doing, but those lanes back open. An update for you tonight. Repairs on the West Winterberry Bridge started today on Marco Island. The bridge had to be shut down in January because the Florida Department of Transportation said it was on the brinks of collapse. The bridge's post tensioning system came loose in January, and that's why the bridge was closed for a few days. The city said back in January that it expects a full reconstruction to start this summer, but needed repairs are now officially underway. So in the meantime, as the repairs are being made until the 18th, the city of Marco Island is just asking that people who usually use the bridge to take San Marco Road as an alternative route. Well, canine units are a key part of law enforcement's response to certain situations. But those dogs and their handlers do have some intense training to go through before they hit the streets. That's what makes the canine team successful is all the training. This while you're probably still might be potty training your puppy out there. Coming up later this hour, we're gonna have a special look at the intense training that is now being conducted in Fort Myers right now. And as we look to that planning forecast, the rest of this evening, sunshine and clear skies. Temperatures, though, they will be dropping. We'll talk about just how low it will go in your neighborhood next.
Over the last uh, year, I'd say a couple of years, you know, we've really seen an influx of, of people moving here. And that's why some developers are working to add three new high-rise condo complexes to downtown Fort Myers' skyline. Yeah, one of the complex is called the Irving. The other two towers planned are the Prima Luce, and those are being constructed right along the Caloosahatchee River, as you see right here. So that's where we find Fox 4's Brianna Brownlee, who's learned just when we can expect to see this new housing. What do you know at this hour, Brie? Good evening, Shari and Adina. Now, this area is blocked off with a fence, and it's an empty lot. But come 2025, that won't be the case because the 22-story Prima Luce will be here. Now, this isn't the only high-rise that's coming to downtown Fort Myers. And downtown high-rises may change Fort Myers' skyline in the next few years. You can't stop progress, dear. For residents like John Campbell, who's lived in Fort Myers since he was six years old, he's not necessarily a fan. I don't like it. But you got to go with the flow. Examples include the long planned Prima Luce in Irving, scheduled to open in 2025. The demand is there again. So, uh, same with the Irving. We're seeing, you know, the market come back for those for those high rise. Steve Belden, Fort Myers Community Development Director, says that demand is the best it's been since the 2008 real estate market crash. For this reason, there's, there's certainly an attraction for certain people to live in in that urban setting. For perspective, take a look at this city graphic, comparing Fort Myers population in the year 2000 to last year of 2022. And with that growth, more buildings, construction is being met with mixed reaction. Well, I'm concerned about that building they're building now because if they build that taller than that one, not that it's going to hurt anything. I'd rather see the face of that building than because it's kind of ugly from up there. When you look down, there's no green. We love it. We're looking to buy a condo. We like the restaurants. We like, you know, that there are bands down there and the people are friendly. Now, we did talk about the Prima Luce in the Irving, but the other high rise is the one. I did reach out to that developer, but he did not get back with me. But the Prima Luce in the Irving did get back with me. And then the Prima Luce did say they will open in 2025, and they're already 50% booked. As for the Irving, they did say they do have a wait list. They're also set to open in 2025. Live from downtown Fort Myers, Brianna Brownlee, Fox 4. All right, Brian. speaking of our housing crisis after Ian, Lee County leaders announced that they will receive more than $1 billion in federal grants to help with the ongoing recovery that is so needed. Right yeah, now. those grants coming from the Housing and Urban Development Department as their secretary stopped in Fort Myers today. Fox 4 was at Beach Baptist Church to hear Secretary Adrian Todman detail some of what Lee County's grants will be used for, as well as a number of rebuilding initiatives, including millions of dollars for Fort Myers Beach. The secretary spoke one on one with us today, saying HUD is working alongside groups like FEMA and is hoping to provide more aid in the coming months. We're here to be part of that journey and be more aspirational, as I mentioned. Our funds are going to be used not just to build back the homes that are here now, but to create mitigation plans to get ready for the next storm, which we hope never comes. So part of the projects Secretary Todman spoke with us about involve finding aid for people who are still in Fort Myers for things like housing redevelopment, infrastructure repair, and future housing affordable projects. We know that need is so great here in Southwest Florida, so that's great news. Well, let's go ahead and shift now to weather. As you're getting a live look from Bayfront Inn in Collier County, it's kind of shocking. I was out early this morning and it was such a gloomy day, but look at Southwest Florida showing off right at sunset. It was it was also a cooler morning Amen. this morning as we bring in Fox Force certified meteorologist Katie Walls. Katie, a gorgeous view behind you too and a little bit of a warm up, but how long is that going to last? All right, so today's highs only hit the mid 70s. The last time we had an afternoon like that, you had to go back to mid-February. That was also the last time we saw morning temperatures as chilly as this morning. So yes, today, the first day below average here this month. Live look now at what is just going to be a beautiful evening from the Tarpon Lodge on beautiful Pine Island overlooking Pine Island Sound. Clouds have now cleared out behind a little wave of energy that came through this morning that brought us that cloud cover and even a couple of spotty showers. I was just checking my local rain gauges here across Southwest Florida and the most I saw 
was all of nine hundredths in the rain gauge in the southwest Cape. So that was it. Most of us picked up just a trace in the rain gauge and you know we could really use that rainfall since March 1st. Officially Fort Myers Page Field we've only received two hundredths and that's including several rounds of rainfall. So Naples we've picked up twenty three hundredths officially since March 1st. Punta Gorda that's our winner. That's where we received just over an inch so far since March 1st. But Punta Gorda is also one of our driest locations and still in deficit by more than four and a half inches. All of us could use that rain. Moderate to severe drought continues. And in Collier County's case, extremely dry conditions, the driest county in the state. Hendry's in second place, and Lee County is currently in third. So no surprise, these three spots in particular remain under that burn ban until further notice. Glades, critically dry and very dry conditions now officially for Charlotte, DeSoto, into Sarasota counties. That particular model, that particular mapping specifically looks at just how moist it is with that top eight inches of the ground, that being the layer that tends to burn. And again, that is why we do have those current burn bans in effect. Collier, Hendry and Glade, Sarasota County always has a yard debris burn ban in effect year round. So our next opportunities for wet weather, they'll be arriving over the weekend. Not great news for those of you with outdoor plans, but it could provide us some much needed rainfall in the rain gauge. But for the next couple of days, enjoy the dry air while it lasts. It's really going to be a beautiful day tomorrow after a pretty chilly start. Tomorrow morning is going to be even cooler than today. So by a couple of degrees, we're going to be starting off with widespread 50s. It'll be one of those days. We'll kick off with mostly sunny skies, winds offshore out of the north and east, but you'll likely want an extra layer for the morning. But then for the afternoon, the dry air, yes, it's quick to cool down, but it's also quick to warm up. So your highs for the afternoon, we're pushing right back to the low and mid 80s, warmer than this afternoon. So you'll be shedding any layers for the afternoon. Lots of sunshine forecast with that wind out of the the east and then looking ahead to your Friday St. Patrick's Day partly cloudy skies on the way high temperatures also staying on the warm side so for tomorrow we'll push toward 82 degrees winds becoming northwesterly in the afternoon and also for your St. Patrick's Day partly cloudy 84 then over the weekend afternoon and evening storms arrive for Saturday with higher rain chances on Sunday. Well, thank you, Katie. Still to come right here on Fox 4 News at 6. It might look like water and bubbles, but the key here is that this has to do with red tide and blue-green algae. The city of Cape Coral says it fits into their plan, and we're going to tell you how that works coming up next.
Well, deputies in Collier County say they are looking for a missing 23-year-old woman. Her family says she has been missing now for a week. So take a look at your screen. Deputies say Itza Ayala lives in Golden Gate with her family. They say she left in her Honda Civic last week and has not returned home since then. Collier deputies asked that if you have seen her or you might know where she could be, you are asked to contact them at the number right here on your screen, 239-252-9300. Well, if you are a local or even here seasonally, you've probably noticed all of the gunk in the water. Oh, yeah. We know some of you have already noticed it and you're telling us about it. To Fort Myers Beach a couple days ago and saw a bunch over there. After the break, we are live in Cape Coral looking at a device the city says could help with those algae blooms even after they get agitated. Plus, violence and the chaos that they're going to find out there in the street. That's the work the trainers say requires the big dogs to get called in. Coming up, we are taking you behind the scenes of canine training happening right here in Fort Myers after the break. People visiting Southwest Florida for spring break say they're seeing red tide and a lot of it. We went to Fort Myers Beach a couple days ago and saw a bunch over there. Now the city of Cape Coral is doing a deep dive to address it. We'll tell you exactly what that is. Plus, today we go behind the scenes to show you everything that goes into training canines for law enforcement. Coming up on Fox 4 News, you are going to hear directly from the instructors, the canine handlers, and find out why these canines are so important for law enforcement and our communities here in Southwest Florida. Live from Southwest Florida, you're watching Fox 4 News at 6. We do have an active bloom post-hurricane. Um, the lake is, is higher than what we would like to see. 
And thank you for staying with us. I'm Nadine Yanis. Water experts are expressing their concerns about future water releases from Lake Okeechobee and how harmful algae could intensify our red tide as well. And of course, then make it into our canals. That's exactly right. Tonight, we know that this could be part of the solution in battling red tide bubble curtains. It's a device that streams up air in order to break up blue green algae across Cape Coral. We've shown you this plenty of times, but now they say they might be able to use them to to battle an even bigger issue. So Fox 4's Cole and Chavez spoke with captains for clean water yesterday out in the Gulf. Tonight he's in Cape Coral along Everest Parkway Canal and Colton this canal is actually getting closed off for maintenance work because they're going to be putting in those bubble curtains. Yeah that's absolutely right they're actually maintaining those bubble curtains which is right here behind me and more on that in just a second but Nadine and Shari what I really want to point out is what we're seeing around our entire area as you said captains for clean water out in the Gulf talking about harmful algae and then Cape Coral leaders out here in the canal on this section earlier today to put maintenance for those bubble curtains. Now, what I want to point out is that this is a section right here where the canal meets the Caloosahatchee River, and that's an area that water experts tell me is an area of concern in the coming months. The possibility of harmful discharges from Lake Okeechobee as we get into the wet season are a reality. As dark storm clouds roll over the Caloosahatchee River, the chance of harmful algae discharges from Lake O into the river during the upcoming rain season is a chance the city of Cape Coral wants its bubble currents, which help filter out harmful algae, to be ready for. So they are intermittently shutting down the Everest Parkway Canal to perform maintenance work. And I want to show you the reason why Cape Coral Police is shutting down this section of the canal. You can see there's one diver in the water right now. It's actually a two-person dive team that's performing this maintenance on these bubble curtains. And the other thing I want to point out is the location of this work. It's right here on the Caloosahatchee River, an area that water experts say can be considered ground zero for things like red tide. The nutrients and pollution in, in that water from the lake is like adding fuel to a forest fire. It makes these blooms um, last much longer. Harmful algae fueling red tide blooms talked about by Captains for Clean Water's co-founder Chris Whitman that are responsible for plaguing beaches with dead fish seen firsthand by visitors like Zach Carr, who were cruising by City Dive Crews. We went to Fort Myers Beach a couple days ago and saw a bunch over there. Um, water experts like Chris Whitman say Lake O water levels mean releases are almost guaranteed. The latest numbers from the region's water management district say since the new year, over five inches of additional water have been added to the lake from the North Basin alone. A problem Whitman says for current red tide because it lasts much longer, longer duration and much more toxic as far as their severity. And I wanted to find out if other projects, because we know there are other bubble curtains throughout the city of Cape Coral, if they're being maintained as well. Now, the city of Cape Coral just got back to me on this request, and they tell me, yes, there are various projects throughout the city, all for these bubble curtains, as they continue to maintain them as well. They say the reason that we're seeing such an active approach to this section is because there's a boat ramp just off in the distance, and because of how much traffic they see going through the area, they want to move into this area as quickly as possible. Live in Cape Coral tonight, Colton Chavez, Fox 4. It really is fascinating how they work as well. Well, tonight, the Lee County Sheriff's Office is releasing new video of an encounter they had with a man who was seen carrying a gun through a neighborhood. Yeah, Fox 4 is also learning the suspect was in a shootout with deputies at a local McDonald's. So here's the video here. It's aerial video from the Sheriff's Office. Sheriff Carmine Racino says this man was walking around in a neighborhood in Fort Myers while holding a gun, even waving it around. At one point, you can see him actually pointed at FMPD officers who were working to keep pedestrians just away from the area and keep them safe and secure that location. What happens next is even scarier for people who were at that nearby McDonald's, Nadine. Yeah. Yeah, so deputies say the suspect actually went into a nearby McDonald's while still holding that gun. You can actually see it here. This is when deputies say he got into a shootout with them. LCSO says it deployed robotic units, a drone, and used non-lethal force to try and coax him out. This is absolutely terrifying. This after he barricaded himself in a bathroom, deputies were finally able to get to the suspect using tear gas. He was arrested, and now 
serving a 30-year sentence, we're told, from the Lee County Sheriff's Office. While developing tonight, the Northport Police Department says it has arrested two people in connection to a murder from two years ago. Earlier this week, officers say they have arrested an 18-year-old and her 40-year-old father. Northport Police say Kenneth Seal Hauer was charged with tampering of evidence and accessory after the fact. He is now on a $300,000 bond. Kayla Seelhauer is now being charged with accessory after the fact as well. Now, investigators say in June of 2021, officers arrived to the scene of a shooting near Biscayne Boulevard. The victim died from their injuries. Police tell us five people now have been arrested in connection to this case. Well, the Nebraska man who was caught bringing drugs to the Punta Gorda airport was found guilty by a jury today. The jury says he was trafficking more than 40 grams of methamphetamine. According to the Department of Justice, Edward Carter was passing through security back in 2020 at that airport when TSA discovered that his toothpaste tube was a little too large. They examined it further and found that it wasn't soft like a tube of toothpaste and was held together by some binder clips instead. A TSA agent tested the tube for explosive material and when deputies arrived, they opened it and found two bags of fentanyl and 47 grams of meth. The meth actually gave a false positive for explosive material. Close your hands. Go, 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 Intense. Today, we are getting, as you see here, a behind the scenes look at the training that takes place for canines in law enforcement. Yeah, our Fox 4 Alicia and Gary actually spent the day with the Fort Myers Police Department officers, along with other officers and deputies from across the country who took part in today's intense training, and it's incredible to see. That's what makes the canine team successful, is all the training. High intensity training violence and the chaos that they're going to find out there in the street. These are long days. These men and women that come out here and do this stuff, this is not easy. Get on the ground. Do it now. Take my dog to the ground. I'm told this training is by two of the best in the country. We've had handlers come from Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, South Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina, upstate New York. So our handlers will travel to find these guys because the training is so good. Police canine trainer Ray Murphy says time and time again, these canines have proven to save got? officers' lives. They've got extremely uh, keen senses so they can find suspects that are hiding, maybe in ambush and things like that. Um, and typically, they're also good for de-escalation. Um, when the dog comes out and they hear the barking, a lot of people will come out of hiding and surrender. The training that we're bringing here, uh, we try to make it chaotic, messy. I mean, we're in environments like this that, that typically replicate what these guys are going to find. Finding narcotics and, explos and or explosives and then helping track criminals, people suspected of violent crimes, and uh, sometimes people that are also lost, like when you have an amber or a silver alert. We've gotten tons of feedback uh, from officers that have gone through almost exactly what we've put them through in training and credited uh, that to saving either their, their lives or their canine lives or both, um, which is pretty humbling for us. We use them as a locating tool, but they're always going to be our partner. Um, they go home with us. After speaking with those officers today, they tell me this is only a part of the training that you get to see. They have to train weekly to stay on top of their toes so they're ready for any kind of situation at the blink of an eye. Here in Fort Myers, Elise Chingari, Fox 4. Well, there is a giant blob, yeah, a blob of seaweed that is floating off Florida's shores tonight. And you might not see it, but you could feel its effects. So coming up after the break, you're going to hear from experts at FGCU as to exactly what this is and what you need to know about it. Plus, a special memorial for one of the darkest days in the history of the Marines is being set up now in Southwest Florida. Yeah, we'll tell you where and show you what the finished project will look like. It's a beautiful evening to get outside after a fairly cloudy start. Well, now those clouds continue to clear. Sunset at 736. Coming up, we'll take a look at just how chilly it will be at sunrise.
I'm thinking a blob like the movie that's going to come and swallow up. It's 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 a it's a floating seaweed. A floating seaweed. So as we battle red tide here in our area, many are now looking to the future as there are reports of tons of seaweed approaching Florida's coastline. It is the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt, and it naturally occurs every year. But this year, some claim that the seaweed could overtake Florida beaches. So meteorologist Andrew Shipley spoke with an expert at Florida Gulf Coast University who says, despite what you're hearing in those scary headlines, you have little to worry about. This is brown algae. It's not like red tide. It's not like blue green algae. FGCU's water school Dr. Barry Rosen specializes in aquatic biology and harmful algal blooms. He says while sarcasm can cause minor issues, it doesn't create any toxins like other algal blooms. The only time it becomes a nuisance, and that's the difference between a harmful algal bloom and a nuisance bloom, is when it can build up on a beach and start to decay. And while it builds up along the coast, sarcasm can smother coral reefs, alter the pH of water, and has the potential to choke out local economies by closing tourism sites, cutting off marinas, and constricting fishing yields. But in the open sea, it can create a critical habitat for a variety of fish and wildlife, and it also creates a ton of oxygen via photosynthesis. All, all algae produce oxygen as part of what they do. And without it, 50% of the earth, that's, that's where our oxygen comes from, is from algae, including this seaweed. In February, sargasm recorded the second highest abundance for a month. But in recent satellite data from NASA, the bloom appears to have slightly decreased. And the question we all want to know the answer to... Is it going to come to our shore? We really don't know that. Dr. Rosen says Southwest Florida residents should be more focused on the current red tide versus the potential of sargasm seaweed washing up on the beach. Right now we have red tide. That's not a wait and see, it's here. To me, that is a much more um, important issue and certainly um, it's real now. We don't know what sargasm is gonna do. We don't know which way it's gonna drift. Dr. Rosen says it's completely possible that sargasm doesn't even reach southwest Florida's coastline. And if it does reach you in the near future, it would compete with red tide for nutrients and release its own set of compounds. The combination would likely decrease our current red tide predicament. In Cape Coral, meteorologist Andrew Shipley, Fox 4. So this is very interesting. The University of South Florida released a forecast for their sargassum at the beginning on the month of the month, presenting a glimmer of hope for the 2023 bloom that it may not be as large as previously believed. USF's forecast calls for sargassum to increase in the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico during the next few months. All right, we always want good news when it comes to how much we're paying for things. Is that right? Mm. Well, we do have some good news for you. Wholesale prices actually fell last month. Good news for those who like to shop in bulk, mm -hmm. too. It was a significant drop, which is good. The better news is that it dropped even more than what economists predicted. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics say the producer price index fell to 4.6% in comparison to last year. That's a nearly 6% drop compared to last year. The Bureau Department says the cost of unprocessed goods like food and gas are down nearly 11% from last year. And we'll take whatever we can get because this is a sign of just how bad inflation is for us right now. Dollar Tree says it's going to stop selling eggs until the price of eggs come back down. The store says it does not anticipate that happening until the fall. Egg prices, as we know, have risen over 60% since last fall, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. All of this impacting the company's 8,000 locations across the U.S. and Canada. So if, if you've been heading over to the Dollar Tree, or like I like to call the Dollar 25 Tree, <laughs> eggs uh, are no longer there. But you know what is always here? This beautiful view that we have for you from the Bayfront in camera overlooking the Collier County and is so gorgeous as we bring in Fox 4 certified meteorologist Katie Walls where we noticed some cooler temperatures today, Katie. Oh yes, the coolest day so far this month and the coolest day going back to mid-February. It was kind of a gloomy start. You know, we had that cloud cover, we had those showers in the mix. Well, all of that is now cleared out and this is what we can enjoy this evening. A beautiful sunset about an hour away Way, right around 740 or so. Live look across the Caloosahatchee River from the Luminary Hotel, downtown Fort Myers, showing off high pressure and control. That means very dry air, not just here at the surface, but also aloft. Hence the reason we're not seeing any cloud cover in the low, middle, or upper parts of the atmosphere. Dew point. When I talk about dry air, 
That's what I'm specifically talking about. So the lower the dew point goes, with a clear sky and a lighter wind, it's a good first guess of just how chilly it will be tomorrow morning. However, don't worry, we're not going to be starting off in the 40s, but we're going to have just enough of a breeze out of the east overnight, 5 to 10 miles per hour, that we will be seeing a cooler start compared to today. First, though, for those of you venturing out this evening, clear skies expected, temperatures dropping to 64 degrees by 10 o'clock, and then falling into the lower 60s by midnight and going down from there. Here's a closer look at that wave of energy, which earlier brought us the clouds and some of those showers that progressed through. But... Big accumulations just weren't to be had with this particular round of shower activity. We picked up just a couple of hundreds in my rain gauge at home, and the highest total I saw was in the Southwest Cape, and that was all of nine hundreds. Most of us only received a trace in the rain gauge. So overnight tonight into tomorrow, clear skies are expected again. Tomorrow morning is going to be a chilly start. Widespread 50s on the way. You'll likely want to layer up. I say layer because the afternoon, which will feature lots of sunshine, the dry air combined with sunshine, it's going to be quick to warm up. So tomorrow afternoon, we are headed back to the low and middle 80s. Wall-to-wall -wall sun expected for tomorrow with that wind continuing out of the east. And with that offshore wind, that's great news, by the way, for those red tide concentrations that could become airborne. So if you are heading to the coast, most of our beaches will be seeing low concentrations tomorrow. And, of course, we'll dive deeper into that tonight on Fox 4 News at 10. I'll be updating beach-by-beach -beach forecasts for you. Looking ahead to your Friday. Friday now, Friday, St. Patrick's Day, looking fantastic. It's going to be even warmer, by the way, on Friday because those winds will shift and become more southerly. Partly cloudy skies expected will push into the mid-80s. For those of you with outdoor evening plans on Friday, picture perfect. Take advantage of it because over the weekend, things change. Wet weather makes a return. That's our next opportunity for scattered showers and storms. Unfortunately, it does look like they'll be on and off from Saturday afternoon into the evening, Saturday night, and continuing into Sunday. It's this cold front. So right here at 5 p.m. on Saturday, things are still pretty quiet, but those showers will slowly spread southward. And then looking ahead to your Sunday, again, they will be on and off. That scenario, a possibility into your Monday as well. Before tomorrow, staying dry, chilly start. Lots of sunshine, though, warms us up toward lower 80s. And looking ahead to that seven-day forecast, warmer for your Friday. Then that other cold front comes through on Saturday, and it's going to be a little chilly for your Sunday. All right, Katie, thank you. Well, a memorial dedicated to Marines lost in combat. It's begun the building process right here in Southwest Florida. So coming up, we're going to give you a look at the true meaning behind it and where you can soon visit.
Today, a moment to reflect and always remember in Port Charlotte as a park that bears the name of a fallen young Marine will soon have a tower to remember the veterans of Beirut. So on October 23rd in 1983, William Gaines Jr. was only 21 years old when terrorists bombed the Marine barracks in Beirut. Gaines was one of the 241 military personnel who died in that attack. Well, this morning, nearly 40 years later, dozens of Beirut veterans, including survivors of that bombing, met at the same park that bears Corporal Gaines's name. Seven years of planning have gone into this project, which is now being called Beirut Peacekeepers Memorial Tower. You could see the groundbreaking here. Officials say the memorial aims to educate people about the th three years the U.S. military was stationed in Lebanon during that nation's civil war. Corporal Gaines, as you see here, his younger brother Michael was only 14 years old when he learned his fam when he and his family learned about his death. That's really why our family kind of wanted to, you know, come back here. We, we're not, we don't live in the area, um, and, you know, but the, the community really rallied around us when Bill died, and I'm seeing them rally again, and I think this is an example of what, you know, all communities can do for those who are lost. And Gaines also spoke about the brotherhood and the camaraderie that is the glue with the veterans of Beirut. Well, local coverage continues even after Fox 4 News at 6 wraps up on our website, fox4now.com. That is actually where you can find this interview with Florida lawmaker who sponsored the state's new abortion ban bill. The bill would ban abortions after six weeks. The current law bans abortions after 15 weeks. Our reporter, Forrest Saunders, spoke with the state representative, Jenna Parsons Malika. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because she's from right here in southwest Florida. You can find that story on our website right now. Also this morning, a neighborhood in Naples was raided at Fox 4's learning that that raid was part of a nationwide hunt. It's incredible video. This story also on fox4now.com. We'll see you back here soon for Fox 4 News at 10. Have a good evening.